It is noon on Thursday, folks. Fed Ralston here in the Think Tech Studios, downtown Honolulu. Uh, we have George Purdy, one of our frequent flyers, uh, uh, far across, far, far across the uh, Kealahikahiki Channel on the island of Lanai in Lanai City, enjoying a day taking care of the kids. Anyway, George, welcome on board again, our show, Where the Drone Leads. Aloha, Tana. Aloha, State of Hawaii. Hey, right on. Glad to have you back, George. You know, this is one of the first, or the few times we've not had actually a drone on the table here at the show, and the reason is uh, we've got a picture of one, which is even farther away. It's a picture of the University of Hawaii a VIP team in their AUVSI drone competition dealing with search and rescue. Uh, presently in Patuxent River, Maryland, and there they are. There the guys are on the runway this morning at the Fax River Airport getting ready to go off and do a competition. We got a twin engine uh, uh, search and rescue aircraft that also drops a water bottle on the, uh, on the found victim, and they're uh, all ready to go out and, uh, and take no prisoners on that one. Anyway, I hope uh, we'll hear later today how they did in the competition. It's a competition among about 20 or 30 universities around the, around the world, frankly, who show up for this competition. Second year UH has been there. Wish them the best, and we'll have them on this show uh, when they get back. Anyway, uh, George, so that's our, our UAS picture uh, of the day and uh, standing in for an actual model. But uh, tell us how things are going on the other end of that chain in Lanai. How are things going with uh, Drone Services Hawaii and your efforts in education and promoting UAS interest with uh, airport fire and with uh, public safety and such on the island? Uh, recently we've been getting ready for uh, hurricane season, so we've been preparing you know, our equipment and um, drone operators on the island and things that they can do to help in case we reach that disaster level. So this summer we're putting together a couple weekends that we'll, all us drone operators get together, uh, invite the kids, other families come to the park and put some hours under our belt and just uh, go flying around the city and open pasture land. So you're kind of getting ready for the hurricane season. In fact, it's interesting, George, you and I first met at Makani Pahili probably this same week, about four years ago on this same subject, uh, UAS or drones in the service of public safety in this regard to the disaster management, disaster operations. So it's kind of cool you're on the show at that same time this year. But tell us about what you've done. So you're organizing uh, work teams or task forces or something uh, in readiness for operations, actual operations with law enforcement, with public safety. Yes, so we're actually going over all the current rules and regulations. Uh, we're making face-to-face -face contact with our first responders and community members. Because we live on a small island and our population is who we got, once the storm hits, you know, our airports are shut down, our harbors are shut down. So we really want to make first contact with our uh, citizens here in our community with drones so that way we know we have resources available during that time of need. So instead of us just finally meeting during the disaster, we want to make that uh, visit earlier when we know each other, we can un we actually go out and train, we see how each other works, we know everybody's weaknesses and positive points, what type of aircraft they got. So when the weather comes up, we know who's got what and what can fly in what area at what time of day. That is a really incredible model. And like you say, you've got a contained environment, a contained population of about 2,500 people. And uh, within there are 10, 20 drones, something like that within the total community. And a compelling need to go forward in a way that doesn't allow uh, agendas to occur. So this is a really good model for a lot of them. I'm, I'm thinking that folks we had on from Texas and Virginia last two weeks on the show would benefit from hearing more about this. Let's just, let me ask you a couple of more detailed questions about what you're doing, George. If you think of the incident command system, and which of course the fire organizations have originated, how do you see the, uh, the public unit use of UAS? How do you see that fitting in with the ICS? Uh, it comes down to communication. We need to give them a staging point, a place to check in. That way they understand the situation and they get updated on what's going on. And it's basically coming down, just being able to communicate with who's got what equipment. 
So you're plugging them in on the situation side of the ICS chain or the planning side, uh, more so than the air ops side? Yes. So we're looking at to entry level for folks that, you know, are not uh, first responder mind, but able to collect that video data that our incident commander and planning folks could use to create that 12 hour incident action plan of what we're going to do next. George. So I really want to keep it very simple and they go out, collect pictures and you let the professionals take that data, um, chew at it, create a plan and then send it out to get resources that we need here. Uh, that's exactly what uh, uh, Helen Nakano has asked for on this island. She runs uh, a lot of things up in Manoa and she's asked for a citizens action team that can be ready at times of need that can go in and get the information and assist in some way. So uh, we need to have you hook up with, uh, with Helen. Actually, you probably know Greg Nakano, I think, from this show uh, yep. more than one time. And uh, Helen is half responsible for Greg. That's how it works. But uh, uh, you've outlined a really typical George Purdy idea. It's a grand idea, George. <laughs> grand in its exec executability, it's uncomplicated, but it's effective. And I, I, I gotta tell you, you're, you're getting imagery, and I'm just gonna repeat it so I make sure I got it right and our viewers get it right, but you're basically using people in the drone community uh, in conjunction with, but not part of, the first responder formal incident command system to produce information as they can and as they see fit and as they're capable and feed it in to the system and let the system digest it and use it as it wants to. And exactly, and that's as simple as uh, the introductory and as we use drones more and our operators get uh, more experience and as these hurricane seasons pass, it'll grow and it can be used in any type of event needed. Then as, as, uh, as time moves on, as experience builds, you could begin introducing the issues we have to deal with, such as uh, privacy and, and rights protection and proprietary information, all the things that are associated with observations made through UAS and cameras and such. Uh, you can uh, begin to see how to manage that. And the people who are actually doing the collecting can be part of that development, developing management scheme. That's it. That's it. Uh, that's. And what will help with that is perpetuating every generation that comes on board. We've got now a place within the incident command system to introduce new folks to help. As more folks get experience under their belt, they'll move up in the chain during various different more extreme duties as necessary. That's great, because you have a feed path into the incident command system, into the first responder uh, technology and professional uh, training and such. Uh, you also have something I think that would be a great way to bring the kids in schools, their parents and teachers together, because there's a real clear objective here to, uh, to their work. It isn't just going out and having fun. Exactly, and it, it, it'll give them an inspiration of what career path they actually want to do. It'll take current educational, um, what is it? Learning habits that are new since when I went to school and what's changing now, it'll slowly introduce it into uh, our community uh, emergency plan a lot quicker than waiting for them to graduate and showing up in the future. We can actually start now. And if, if I can offer an opinion on that as well, I think that that experience taken together would also be extremely valuable for the NFPA, for example, as they're going through their, uh, their uh, methods to come up with in-state user requirements in the fire domain. And I think they're gonna watch over the rest of public safety. They could, they could use you as a model example and as a place to get valid field tested issues uh, that current drones don't satisfy. If we need more flight time, if we need more uh, wind tolerance and turbulence tolerance, if we need the ability to handle uh, low light conditions and things like this, this would be coming out of your experience. Yes, and then the other part too is that these younger fo folks are learning from the experience of older fo folks and now we can also pass down that knowledge to increase our future response much better. <laughs> That's a, uh, uh, George, 
Uh, you're, you're, allowed to, you're allowed three bright ideas on this one half hour show. I think you already hit all three of them. So we have to ask you to no more bright ideas. We've got to develop these that are going. But I, I, I can't thank you enough for those, those cool ideas because my mind's still thinking about, uh, about how to take that over here to Oahu. We have uh, connections with HPD, HFD, and such, and having them kind of follow what you're doing would be a great uh, opportunity to uh, put that into our environment on this island as well. Oh, absolutely, and then having some sort of uh, competition, even at the schools, um, having drawn up, running a whole scenario, students who may be looking into these careers or even taking their movie experience with drones, just image collecting and being able to send it to an emergency scenario, what happened in that area, let the first responders um, analyze that video and come up with their response plan. It can be that simple in a round table environment. And we could even add to that the other functions that drones can provide, for example, acting as a radio relay or acting as a collector of uh, chemical information, for example, if there's a fire of some kind, and rather than putting a fireman at risk to go in and figure out what the components burning are, send a drone in with sensors on it. So, and the, the kids could figure this stuff out probably faster than certain people at this table who might be really old. So uh, you've, you've like, once again, set a really interesting path for the rest of us to follow, George. And. Uh, uh, I, I think I want to take this very, the video coming from the show, right to our, our friends at HPD and HFD and see if we can come up with something similar here. Uh, I'll be happy to. I'll be happy to fly up, come down, sit down, have coffee and donuts, and create something. I think we're at that point that, you know, the, the community and the public is educated enough that they'll support us. And I like that point you made about the community and the Especially public. Especially after uh, this hurricane. Go ahead, I'm Go sorry, ahead. I cut you off. Go. Oh. George, can you repeat that oh. last paragraph? Yeah, so the point is for me is that I think the community and the public, they're educated enough that we as first responders come in with these ideas now that we can show them, especially this hurricane season. You know, I, I got a feeling something nasty is gonna happen, but if we come up with what I'm trying to do here and show the examples of what good can come out of it, in the future, we can grow this um, event training exercise program as a community based with fire department, police department, and schools, and community members that fly drone to get together and support anything that we need to do. That's great, it could apply to way beyond the hurricane season. Good, uh, rescue at sea, for example, even coastal erosion issues that are, are uh, slow speed disasters rather than fast disasters, still the same things needed. Um, let's pick that up and, and develop how we might take the next step over on this island after our one minute break here. <laughs> You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, 25 talk shows by 25 dedicated hosts every week helping us to explore and understand the issues and events in and affecting our state. Great content for Hawaii from ThinkTech. Watching Think Tech Hawaii, Hawaii's leading digital media platform for civic engagement, raising public awareness on tech, energy, diversification, and globalism. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. It is Thursday, folks, lunchtime on Thursday, and we are here with your show, Where the Drone Leads, on Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, Ted Ralston here, hosting in Honolulu, and we have across the Kealakahiki Channel, we have George Purdy standing by in Lanai City, and uh, once again, blowing us away with the bright ideas that come off of that island, or at least out of George's house on that island. And George, uh, once again, thanks for joining us on, uh, on your lunch hour. The discussion we had before break was this, this wildly creative idea of having 
citizens groups that are performing drone based collection of information in conjunction with with uh, formal and professional public safety people but still separate from them so they're not entangled in the in the in the professionalism aspects but are on the developing edge and feeding information in by drone into the public safety circle of operation and George has, uh, this kind of filling in what you said, George, or uh, interpreting it, you've created a way that the citizens, the kids, the schools, the, the public can be part of that larger picture with their drones assisting in the collection of information, but uh, yet protecting the people from any kind of risk situation that first responders get paid to go take. So that's a really interesting uh, structure. And um, you've, you've already talked about how it, it, it fits in the planning side of the incident command system, and that's an important uh, piece to think about as well. And I'm um, just thinking how, uh, on this island, how, or other places, that, that might be developed. I wonder what kind of a organizational structure we would uh, turn to to put this together, like maybe the CERT, you know, the, the uh, community emergency reaction teams, maybe in conjunction with the National Guard as some kind of a citizen adjunct unit to them. Thoughts about that for our environment here on Oahu, George, that we might, might uh, plant that seed in? Okay, you broke up on that last part. I couldn't okay. hear anything. What I was uh, suggesting was that uh, uh, we have the formal structures. We have the police and the fire. We have the National Guard. We have uh, disaster uh, and emergency management departments and such. They tend to be collect. They, they tend to put a barrier around themselves. They are the professionals that are within their bond. Uh, how would you think on we can take your idea and push it forward on this island, in terms of uh, uh, providing this citizens adjunct to the to the professional responder teams? How would the responder teams take that? How would we find a place that they would find it comfortable to have us do that? Uh, for an example would be, um, say like the National Guard, what resources do they have to do this event? So like for me on Lanai, our resources in our department, um, once 911 or we're activated initially for a big event, our resources are used up right at that phone call. So I need my resources to be my community member is something that I have on island before I get professional help and professional resources from another island. So for Oahu, in each department, it'll go down to what is their resource capability, and once they exhaust it, now that's where the component of bringing in your community members to fill that gap that they need help. Where is their limit? Where is their cutoff? Once you can understand and notify, identify where their resources are maxed out, that's when these public and private citizens come into play and you need the game plan on how you want them to come in to fill your needs. So you need a game plan, you need a roster, you need some form of certification perhaps or some uh, acknowledgement that the person's been through some training and is, and is safe and isn't gonna get into uh, harm's way in the process and you need some notification scheme to let them alert them that, that the need is on and see if they can respond kind of an informal, formal structure. Yes, and it comes down to like, you know, for HFD, what is their capability? Where do they exhaust all resources possible? And then from that point, create that link in exactly what you just said with that roster. That, uh, and that's where all these little programs and school activities and public events can come into play. We can slowly educate the community in that sense. Uh -huh. And having it being fun and having first responders and these resource groups understand what they have in their community. And that comes down to people that work in these departments knowing their neighborhoods, knowing who's there. That's interesting. Are you uh, taking this all the way to everybody getting a uh, FAR 107 certificate? Or in your training program, you get some kind of a, some kind of a hunter's, equivalent of a hunter's uh, license, that kind of a thing? That's that's where I'm thinking is more that hunter safety because we're looking at something that if these major professional organizations run out of resources, can we educate the community enough to actually come out and help us? And I believe we can. 
with a simple UAS air safety card. If we are able to carry firearms in Hawaii at 10 years old to go and get your license to go hunting, we can do the same with drones. Because you won't reach that level of need unless you exhaust all your resources. At that point, it's too late if you didn't plan for it now. So uh, should we collectively uh, think of a, like a one day training course that's held on the weekend or maybe three of them that are constitute a reasonable period of exposure to the to the to the to the uh, formality of interacting with the first responders and and some kind of a base training program people would go through to get that equivalent of the hunter safety card for UAS uh, yeah I believe so I believe a nice little one or two day program is pretty much uh, all you would need and you know how these are very responsible people on their own understanding the current FAA section uh, 336 rules so they've got a good understanding now our program would be identifying and help them to understand how we need their help and what steps and procedures you need to do to come out and help us and have that two-way communication that would be a, uh, a, a, a a brilliant stroke in terms of getting the public to come forward to assist the uh, the, uh, the professional uh, responder organizations. So uh, I think the outline you've created and the hunter safety card concept, uh, what we should do is maybe get together offline somehow and sketch out what that three-day program might look like or three successive weekends or something like that to generate the training and what the training content is. Obviously, we just have to make sure that people that we aren't put, asking people to put themselves at risk. Yes, and it'll come down to basically the incident command itself to verify and accept that acceptable risk or just say, no, thank you for your time. Or, you know, you put them in the area where they're there to help if needed. And a lot of the community members just want to be there in case they need your their, their assistance. That's what I found with my community. If you get them in an area where they're prepared and ready to help, you may not need them, but you had them show up. And the other part of that too is you actually control the airspace because they're there ready. They're not out there uh, doing John Wayne and doing their own thing. You can actually use them efficiently. I think that's And that's part of the training program is teaching them the efficiencies of not wasting anybody's time, not wasting resources. You're there, ready to go. Here's your assignment. Can you do it? Go do it. Bring me back the information. Thank you very much. And that, what you just also implied here is that uh, by this process, we would generate a greater public awareness of the incident command system, how it works, and what the expectations can be when there's when a disaster might apply to them. I, I think I can speak for our community of Waimanalo would be very interested uh, in this. We have Bobby Kahana in the police department down there, and we have uh, Rufino, you know Rufino already, and some other guys who would probably maybe want to think of Waimanalo as a prototype. I can't speak for them, but I would say Waimanalo could stand up and, and take this on with the half a dozen drone operators that, it, that are in the, in the town today and uh, learn through experience what this might actually turn into. Oh, I totally agree, and that's how it should start in communities like yours. And then now you can use that as a model for other communities, because if you cut off that roads entering into Waimanalo, you're just like Lanai on Oahu. You're isolated. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly right. Yeah, and then comes in the really interesting uh, undercurrents here, and uh, there are always issues of uh, of uh, cybersecurity and people who will want to penetrate your system for their own gain or for malicious uh, e effects of some kind. So we can actually use this as part of the training and awareness for cybersecurity. I mean, drones are basically a piece of the cyber community and the information they collect enters into the cyber uh, domain in some way and information can be used and can be misused. Uh, people can be uh, valid people or they can be malicious. So there's always that side we need to think about and getting our, all, our, all of our people exposed to those issues and thinking about them in advance works for more than just disaster operations of the type we're thinking of. It works in the whole world of cybersecurity. Oh yes, and that's what a lot of these uh, training events do for even us professionals 
is that we start finding the flaws and then we start addressing the flaws to figure out what went wrong and how can we fix it. So adding cybersecurity to this and exactly what you said, it, it, it's a win-win. And then during a disaster of necessity, that's the greatest payoff is how do we um, help our community to the best ability and resources available at that time. And all of this, that all of what we're talking about here could be considered a dynamic and ongoing real-time development of uh, response back to the FAA on the one side for UAS CERT, to the uh, uh, ANSI organizations uh, for the uh, technical standards and means of certification, and to NFPA and organizations like that on how UAS functionality and the people associated with it uh, should be thought of in regard to fire safety and uh, the role oh, yeah. and the technology that's needed to enhance that. It would be really cool for an organization on Lanai or Waimanalo to say, hey, here's what we got today, here's these various UAS, here's what they do, and here's what they don't do. So, Mr. Manufacturer, if you want to be really successful in this domain, you need to do the following. You need to improve the, re the uh, resilience of the, of the system, you may n n uh, need to make it work in the rain, uh, need to make it work when someone's hands are salt water wet and change the batteries. There's a lot of things that we would discover along the way that would be quite useful, I think, fed back into the manufacturing community. Oh, yes, and it could also open up some sort of new R&D manufacturing for Hawaii. Yeah, absolutely, even on Lanai, for that here, matter. We have a, exactly, and that's where one of my focus in expanding my company is to get to that level. Okay. And uh, how is the company working these days? How are you guys doing? You have a couple of thousand square feet of uh, shop area, I recall, and uh, is that starting to work? Oh, it's it's work. We can't keep up. Tell you us know, about it's it. Nice, it's nice to be at that point where we're not worrying about being pushed out. Uh, we've set a tone and followed regulations correctly that, you know, a lot of financial folks and a lot of politicians said that we would fail, but we stuck to our guns, we stuck to regulations, we help adjust and create regulations to fit the need, trying to support our community in first responders, education, and private citizens. And Okay. But well, well, George Purdy, you know, uh, we're just a young company, we're in our third year, and... Okay, we, I, I think we've managed to run ourselves right out of time here, just about the oh, time okay. the Skype is breaking down. But George, it's so cool to have you back on again. Thanks so much for coming on. And once again, thanks for the, uh, the brilliance of the ideas and the leadership you provide in the thought leadership area as well as operational leadership. I think we're going to take your ideas and try to copy them in Waimanalo and other places on Oahu here, and we'll keep you in the loop and uh, support each other. So once again, George, thanks so much for coming on. And we'll see you all next Thursday, Thanks, folks. Ed.